Laser. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Next, we have our new professor, uh, Kristen Buck, talking about the metal biochemistry. All right, um, so yeah, my name's Kristen and I'm a chemical oceanographer, brand new. So I figured since I'm brand new, I would start with an introduction to what I do and, and why I like <laughs> it so much. Um, so I'm interested in trace metal biogeochemistry and you should be familiar with this, but uh, when I talk about trace metals, typically what we're talking about is the transition metals here. Um, some people also in the trace metal community are interested in some of the metalloids like arsenic and non-metal selenium. But when you look at the periodic table, this time is shaded in terms of the abundance of these elements in seawater. It's a little counterintuitive, lowest concentrations in warm colors, highest concentrations in cool colors. You can see that these trace elements are present in low concentrations, particularly with respect to the macronutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, and the alkali metals and the halogens which make up your major cations and anions in seawater. So the concentrations of trace elements are low in seawater. We call them trace elements for a reason. Um, their concentrations are on the order of nanomolar to picomolar. So nitrogen and phosphorus, these are present um, at concentrations of micromolar, so a thousand times more abundant than the trace elements. The um, major constituents of seawater, the cations and anions, these are present at uh, millimolar concentrations, so a millionfold more abundant than trace elements. This makes sampling and analysis of trace elements really challenging. You can imagine trying to measure metals that are at nanomolar or picomolar concentrations in a background of millimolar alkali metals is difficult and it requires um, some fun. I particularly am interested in iron and copper and these elements are also known to be contamination prone. They're much more abundant on land and um, in us than they are in seawater. So I an iron ship covered in copper-based anti-fouling paint, and I want to get a sample that represents the water, right? Not the fact that I showed up that day to sample it. And so this has been an ongoing challenge in measuring these elements. Um, it makes a lot of fun to do now because we're just, it, it's really only in the last 20 years that we've gotten good at sampling um, for these. In addition, these elements are really important for biology in the ocean. So the bioavailability of trace elements, bioavailability um, is referring to not only the concentration of the element, but also the chemical form that it's present in, the speciation of it, heavily influences biological productivity. This table is from um, a paper by Morell and Price, and it's just showing the different biogeochemical processes that trace elements are essential for. So photosynthesis, respiration, um, macronutrient uptake and macronutrient processing. John was just talking about um, nitrogen fixation, requires iron um, and molybdenum. Iron, iron's my favorite, I won't lie. Um, but I like copper too, so I'll talk about that as well. But iron is involved, this is a list of proteins that iron's involved in. Iron is, a, is an essential micronutrient in the oceans. It is used for photosynthesis and respiration. It's also really important in the nitrogen cycle. So to take up nitrogen and process nitrogen, phytoplankton require iron to do that. Um, this is also illustrated nicely here, although I guess it's kind of small and hard to see. But this is the nitrogen cycle and the different metal cofactors that are involved in this. And you can see iron is routinely showing up in almost every step of this process. As a consequence, if phytoplankton don't have enough iron, they tend to not be able to, well, they can't grow as effectively as they, they would otherwise, but they also don't take up nitrogen. And so you end up with a residual nitrate concentration in surface waters. And this is a, a common visual way to look at um, the possibility of iron limitation. This map is showing surface water nitrate concentrations in the global ocean. Um, and you can see right away, so this is more typical, high concentrations in warm colors, low concentrations in cool colors. And you can see that the regions that have high nitrate concentrations in surface waters, these are regions we consider to be iron limited. We call them HNLC, high nutrient, lower than expected chlorophyll. Subarctic Pacific, Equatorial Pacific, and the Southern Ocean are the big three. And these cover estimated from models roughly 40% of the surface ocean. So while nitrogen is indeed extraordinarily important for phytoplankton, so is iron in the modern ocean. Switching gears to talk about copper, copper is a little bit different than iron. So iron really exclusively plays a role as either a limiting nutrient or a, or a sufficient nutrient in the environment. Copper on the other hand, I like to refer to as a Goldilocks element. So everybody remembers Goldilocks, right? With her porridge and not too hot, not too cold. 
When you talk about elements um, in the marine environment and their effect on phytoplankton, I think it's easy to look at it from the perspective of a growth response curve. So looking at the, um, the effect of changing bioavailable element concentrations versus phytoplankton growth rate. And there's kind of three main categories here. Limitation, the blue section, as you increase the bioavailable metal concentration, phytoplankton respond positively. This indicates that that element is likely limiting their growth. As you get to a green section here, as you change, increase the concentration further, the phytoplankton don't respond to it. They've, they've got plenty of that element and they're not worried about it. And if you go high enough, you get into this nasty red zone where as you continue to increase the concentration of that element, the phytoplankton growth rate starts to decline. They start to die. So copper is unusual, or not necessarily <laughs> unusual, but it is interesting in the marine environment because all three of these regions exist. So there are regions of the ocean where copper is a limiting nutrient, typically tied with iron limitation. The subarctic Pacific is an example. Um, and then there's also regions where copper is toxic in nearshore waters, where humans are putting a lot of copper in the environment. We use copper for a lot of things, and it ends up in the marine environment in coastal waters. Goldilocks, you know, she doesn't like her porridge too hot. She doesn't like it too cold. Phytoplankton don't like their copper too high or too low. They like to be right here in the middle. Um, I am actually, a lot of the work I do with copper is on the co copper toxicity side, and um, phytoplankton are really sensitive to copper concentrations. So this figure, this is from Larry Brand's work um, back in the 80s, and it's looking at the effect of, this is a log scale on the X, of bioavailable copper concentrations versus phytoplankton growth rate. And these are, the data is lumped by groups. So diatoms in blue, coccolithophores in orange, dinoflagellates in red, and cyanobacteria in green. And you can see that as the bioavailable copper concentration increases, the phytoplankton, they start to tank. And Pointing out the scale here, this is 10 to the minus 11 molar of copper 2 plus. So these are really low concentrations. And it's important to note that I didn't just plot copper concentration, bioavailable copper concentration. And this is where things are really interesting to me, is not effect of total copper concentration. It's the chemical form that copper is in. And the copper 2 plus ion is generally the most bioavailable form of copper in seawater or in water in general. You can also see that not all organisms respond the same way or at the same levels. Diatoms are larger cells. They're less sensitive to metal toxicity. Cyanobacteria are the smallest. They're more sensitive. But all of these organisms start to die off at around 10 to the minus 11 molar. And, and I'll show you some data later about where that comes into play. Um, but that's kind of a threshold for copper toxicity. And it is not necessarily related to total copper concentration. So, Iron and copper, kind of two different ends of the spectrum. Iron is a, a limiting nutrient. Global ocean um, really plays a role in, in the carbon cycle and, and big picture um, concepts. And then copper is a more local effect, uh, something that, um, or at least that I look at more locally. Geotraces is a global ocean survey. So we have very poor understanding of trace elements in the ocean compared to most of the other, the other elements. You can find global maps of nitrogen and phosphorus in surface waters, even silica. Um, for hydrography, we've done many global ocean surveys for temperature, salinity, things like that. This is really difficult to do for trace elements. We have challenges trying to sample the water column efficiently and then measure these, these samples. It's, um, it's not simple. We've tried to do this before, so you're probably familiar with JGOFs, the Joint Global Ocean Flux Study. This was done um, gosh, about 30 years ago or so, and maybe longer. Um, and they tried to measure trace elements on that, and they got drastically different concentrations for the same elements <coughs> that in the same places. And then for iron, for example, they got basically the same concentration everywhere, which was really pretty high. So that was an effect of methodological issues. Geotraces is our first global ocean survey for trace elements and isotopes using techniques that are, have been proven um, and intercalibrated in terms of analytically to measure trace elements in the ocean. So there are 30 countries involved in this program. This map is showing, um, it'll take 10 years, or the program is planned for 10 years, started in 2010. Um, and this map is showing the different baseline surveys that are planned uh, as a part of this program. Um, the black and yellow legs are legs that have already, cruise legs that have already <coughs> been com completed, excuse me. And then the red are ones that are planned, with the exception this one here, off of uh, South America. We just, that's a US leg that we just finished um, a few weeks ago. So I get funding from this program, and I'll talk about what I do as part of it. 
But this program will do not only baseline surveys, so within one degree of resolution for latitude um, and longitude or higher across the basins. And with depth, we're, in the US program, we're doing 37 depths per profile down to within, they're trying to get within 10 meters of the bottom, but that becomes challenging with, with the sampling. Um, all the transition metals are being covered in these analyses, but so is most of the rest of the periodic table and, and isotopes. I had mentioned earlier that it's challenging to sample for these, so I thought I'd just show some sampling equipment that we use for them. Um, we use something called GoFlow bottles in the US program. This is a picture of one here. They're very similar to the Niskin bottles you're probably familiar with from classic oceanographic sampling. There's a few differences. Um, for one, these go down closed. So you can see that here on this rosette. We also put shower caps on the top of them when we're loading them on deck because we're very paranoid as a crowd in general. Um, and this frame is a titanium frame with an epoxy coating, which helps prevent metal contamination of, of the samples. And then the line going up here, we still have to use an iron line because we need to be able to communicate with the rosette to close the bottles at the depths we want, but we use a Kevlar coated um, line which results in an incredibly intense winch actually. This one over here, this is the Dutch version which is fundamentally different from everybody else's. Their bottles are custom made of Teflon all the way through. Our bottles are PVC with Teflon lining um, and then they're on a titanium frame as well with a, with a coating. And what they do is, so the US puts shower caps on their bottles, loads them on deck and then they offload individual bottles into a van to sample. These guys, they put the bottles over, bring them up, and they put the entire rosette into a van, which is kind of an interesting operation to watch. And their people wear shower caps. So the joke is that the US put the shower caps on the bottles and the Dutch put them on their people. And <laughs> anyway, at least I got a laugh out of that. Sometimes it doesn't go over. Um, so it's challenging to sample for these, but we've, we've gotten to the point where we can do this. Um, in the US program, we've done two cruise legs so far. The North Atlantic leg, which went out of Portugal. Um, we lost a drive shaft off of Africa, so it ended up being two cruises. Um, but we did the first one in the red dots here out to Cape Verde, and then the blue leaving from Woods Hole through Bermuda. The Bermuda Atlantic Time Series Station is a reference spot for this program in the North Atlantic, and then across um, back to Cape Verde for an overlap. <coughs> In the Eastern Tropical South Pacific, we did a zonal um, leaving out of Manta, Ecuador, and moving across. This just finished um, like two days before Christmas in December. And these are 60-day cruises, so they, they bulk up pretty fast. Um, I think I mentioned the North Atlantic, we were doing 37 depth <laughs> profiles. We ended up, I ended up with almost 600 samples from that program, which is about six times my cr total career number of samples, like cumulative, uh, the Pacific is sending me just over 900. So we seem to be kind of ramping up in re resolution as well. All right, so for me, I'm funded by Geotraces to look at the organic complexation of iron. So iron binding ligands. So not just iron, but iron speciation. What, what are ligands? I'm skipping slides already. So ligands, a general definition, these are typically small organic molecules, typically small, meaning that they're dissolved, often in the soluble fraction, but sometimes they can be colloidal in size. Organic molecules that form very stable complexes with metals. We describe these ligands as classes because we don't measure them individually. They are present at nanomolar, typically present at nanomolar concentrations, the, the ligands that are binding metals, in a background of micromolar DOC, something like 60% of which is nearly impossible to characterize at this point. So it, it's an um, operational definition, and we, I use an electrochemical method, which I'm not going to go into today, but I could talk for hours about. Um, and we divide them into ligand classes. So L1 being the strongest ligand class, this is what dominates complexation at ambient metal concentrations. Weaker ligand classes, and as they go progressively weaker numbers, and these are buffer metals as you change the metal concentration in the system. So. The reason that ligands matter is that organic complexation alters speciation. So we talked, or I mentioned that the bioavailability of an element is dependent on the concentration of that element, but also the chemical form that it exists in. By binding a metal to an organic ligand, you change the metal, the speciation, the distribution of metal between the different inorganic and organic complexes. Metal bioavailability is then altered. In seawater, more than 99.99% of dissolved iron is complexed by organic molecules in, in most systems that we look at. Not every system, but 
almost every system. For copper, it's generally more than 99%, and it can vary very widely depending on, on the environment you're in. But these ligands are very important in particular for these two elements. So what, what are these ligands? What is L1? So L1, you know, I, I could go into some detail about, but is what I consider to be the most important um, of those ligand classes. Siderophores is a common example of L1. So I should actually preface this, that I'm going to go through a list of, of different types of ligands that we've identified as binding iron in the marine environment. However, these also have been shown to bind copper in the marine environment. And there's just recently some debate about, from our geotraces data, about how selective these ligands are between iron and copper. So Derefor is an example of a very selective ligand in the sense that these are typically produced by bacteria to acquire iron from the, marine envi from the environment. They were originally identified in terrestrial systems. So these are very strong iron binding um, ligands. There's been studies in the, in the ocean showing that um, the ligands we measure have similar functional groups to siderophores. They look like L1 from an analytical perspective. And then more recently, techniques have been developed to actually extract individual ligand molecules out of seawater and measure them. And in, in picomolar concentrations, we're finding that they are, in fact, siderophores. And I put up some pictures of um, some examples of these. We're still very limited in the methodology here to look at this. And I suspect they're more prevalent than picomolar in some environments. But these tend to be associated with bacteria. And they seem to be more prevalent in the upper water column, so associated with phytoplankton communities, um, even though they're produced by bacteria. Humic substances are a more diffuse ligand. So these are much more poorly defined. Um, they're more of an analytical or operational definition. These have been measured directly in seawater. So unlike um, all the other ligand classes or ligands that we are aware of in seawater, humic substances are the only ones you can directly measure with the same electrochemical methods we use to measure ligand classes, which allows us to see them in environments even when we're not looking for them. And they've been found predominantly in coastal and deep waters at nanomolar concentrations. So there's some argument that these might be the ligands that make up the deep water component of complexation. And then there's some others. So exopolysaccharides, these are a common component of DOC. They are present at micromolar concentrations. And then things like nanofibrils and um, TEP-like or transparent exopolymer substances. So this is in my mind, kind of a soup of, of different organic molecules combined in the, in the seawater. And these are having a very strong effect on the bioavailability and cycling of elements. And they tend to fall along a size um, continuum. So this is um, specific for iron, but could also be thought of as similar for copper, where you have you know, iron soluble iron complexes, inorganic complexes, which are very, very rare in seawater. Um, and then you get down to you know, the siderophore type ones, which are soluble, and you kind of move up. This makes them even more challenging analytically because we filter our samples. And we don't always filter our samples through the same filter types. And there's still a lot of discussion about how we try and compare, particularly between the trace metal biogeochemistry and the organic geochemistry, where we have two fundamentally different approaches to being clean samples. Trace metal chemists, we tend to really avoid metals, and we like to use a lot of plastic for our sampling and, and processing. Organic geochemists tend to try and avoid plastics and stick to more metallic um, sampling techniques, and, and we're still kind of coming together on that. Um, one of the activities I am involved in is I chair a SCORE working group with Maeve Lowen at the University of Plymouth in England and Sylvia Sander at the University of Otago in New Zealand, and looking specifically at linking together the work of trace metal biogeochemists, organic geochemists, and modelers to try and do a better job of constraining the methodology we used to analyze four ligands um, and to promote, well, these are our terms of reference, so promoting improvements in our quality, accessibility, and development of analytical methodologies and characterizing which components of the dissolved organic matter pool are most relevant towards metal binding in the environment. I should point out iron and copper are not the only trace elements that are bound by organic ligands, but they are the two that have been shown to be on the order of more than 90 to 99 percent complex by organic ligands. Zinc, nickel, cobalt, these are all elements that also have associations with organic ligands and are very, uh, there's very limited studies on those by comparison to iron in particular. Um, and then lastly, to identify the role of ligands in microbial ecology and marine biogeochemistry. So, so getting back into, into bigger, bigger picture questions. 
And this is really, so, you know, these are really the research questions that I am interested in and that my lab has been pursuing and will be continuing to pursue here at USF. So, you know, what is the distribution of metal binding ligands in the oceans? Are they really as prevalent as we think? You know, early studies, pre-geotraces, iron still was the most studied of, of all of the elements for um, organic complexation, especially in the open ocean, but you're still talking less than 10 samples from below 1,000 meters, no samples from, you know, the Indian Ocean, the South Pacific, or the South Atlantic, so really selective um, studies. Geotraces will help that with a much more high-resolution um, approach to sampling and analysis. Where do these ligands come from? You know, what it, what's the provenance of these, of these ligands? And where do they go? How are they lost? Are they photosensitive? Are they stable? I mean, if we're measuring them at depth, um, what does that mean about their stability? And then how do ligands influence biogeochemical cycles? What is their role in the oceans, really? Um, and how will changing, this is um, one I haven't had a chance to address yet, but I'm very interested in, how will changing ocean chemistry, namely something like ocean acidification, influence ligand cycling and corresponding organic complexation and metal bioavailability? Complexation in general is highly sensitive to pH, changes in pH. And this is something that hasn't been looked at for organic complexation um, of these elements yet. So just briefly, geotraces is really the, the avenue for, for me looking at the distributions of, of ligands in the marine environment. This is the data on the stronger L1 class. So, which I consider the most important, in, and I'm showing it as excess L1. So this is the ligand concentrations that exist in addition to what's already binding the iron in the system. Across this entire basin, all of the iron effectively is complexed by ligands, with the exception of one place in this hydrothermal vent plume. This is an area where there is no excess ligands. The iron is coming out of that vent in an inorganic iron sulfide-like nanoparticles. Um, but you can bet your hat that ligands are facilitating the transfer of any of that iron into the dissolved phase and into the water column and stabilizing that as you move away from the vent, although we have some work to do there. One of the things that stood out to me from this data set is that these ligands are present through the water column. They're present in the deepest waters and the surface waters, but there's also a lot of variability, not all of which can be explained by hydrography. Um, bats the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series site, this is this station here, it stands out from the rest of the profiles. This one here, I assumed this was an uh, analytical issue. We had a problem there, right? An outlier. We, we have something in oceanography called oceanographic consistency. And in trace metal chemistry, you know, we struggle with contamination issues and lots of other analytical problems. So we look for oceanographic consistency, and when we don't have it, we tend to say, oh, that's probably an outlier. Um, and that was my original take on this. And then I saw the copper binding ligand data that's been done by another lab, and they have that same hot spot in that same spot. And so maybe it's a sampling issue, but there's a lot we need to work out about why these profiles look this way. Um, in terms of where ligands come from, I've done some experiments, and you know, biology seems to be really important for us. Not surprising. Biology, you know, as a chemist, it's hard for me to admit. Biology is actually really <laughs> important. Um, and these are just simple phytoplankton incubation experiments. I won't go into too many details, but days of incubation on the X, excess L1 again on the Y. And what I found is that as you, as you grow phytoplankton in light conditions with high macronutrient concentrations, so effectively forcing an iron limitation type system, or, or in a natural, in this case, um, natural HNLC environment, you see these very high concentrations of excess ligands building up in the, in the system. Where those are coming from, we still haven't answered and is something that I plan to pursue. But there's still a lot left here. You know, the role of grazers, there's, there's lots of things to consider in terms of the biological work and what is happening at depth, because these were light-based surface studies, right? Um, and there's a lot of water column left to look at. How do ligands influence biogeochemical cycles? Well, there's lots of ways, but one of the studies, I, you know, to not ignore copper too badly, I showed this earlier about the effect of increasing free copper, copper 2 plus concentration on phytoplankton growth, and how at about 10 to the minus 11 molar, all these organisms really start to die. Well, when you look in real systems, these are samples from San Francisco Bay in California, which was part of the work I did as a postdoc and when I first got out to um, Bermuda as a research scientist. This is looking at the total copper concentration on the X versus the log free copper concentration on the Y. And these were done in, in titrations of the seawater samples. And what you find is that where you reach this threshold of 10 to the minus 11 molar, 
free copper, which is where things start to be toxic for the biology, can be at dramatically different total copper concentrations. And the, this is all from one estuary. And the difference is the organic composition and the, and the presence of ligands. And so these ligands exert an enormous influence on free copper concentrations, particularly in environments of high copper. So I'll just leave it as this. These are the, the research questions I'm either actively involved in or planning to be actively involved in soon. Um, and I would be happy to talk about it more as possible. No. Um, so I use, we use, we filter the samples. All of the work that I do is in the dissolved, well, not all, but predominantly in the dissolved phase. Yeah. So we filter the samples <laughs> first, usually a 0.2 micron filter. But the pre-concentration of, of the ligands and, um, and the ligand complexes is done by electrochemistry. So what I do is I, t I take a filtered seawater sample, I aliquot it out into a series of vials, I do a titration of iron so, or copper, whichever element I'm looking at, um, so increasing the metal concentration through those vials. Then I add an electroactive competing ligand to all of those vials. In doing that, that electroactive ligand competes for the iron or the copper against natural ligands, and then I can measure the complex of iron with that ligand on the surface of an electrode. Um, and then you can do some math uh, to go back and figure out what the concentration was of the ligands, which is really from that titration, and the conditional stability constant of the complexes that can form with the element by the competition with that added ligand. But you don't do any analytical determining what the ligands are? I do not do characterization of the ligands. Um, I have colleagues who do that that I work with, and you know, I, I've debated kind of getting into that, but that's, I have enough on my plate with with the side that I'm looking at for now. But yeah, there are some really great techniques you can use with ESIMS um, to, to look at individual molecules, but it is not simple. Um, and one of the real limits of what we have in seawater right now is, uh, is the columns that they, so in that case they use a column and they, um, they run it through the column and, and try to capture the, the complexes on that column. The problem is, is that they really have to use a hydrophobic resin for that, at, or do use a hydrophobic resin to this point. So they're eliminating the hydrophilic ligands that are out there, which are, you know, arguably possibly more common. And then you said that the copper, the cyanobacteria were the most sensitive to the copper. Yeah. And what, what is that? Is that like Prochlorococcus? Yeah, Prochlorococcus, um, It You know, it's, it just goes back to surface area to volume ratios and diffusion gradients, right? You know, these small cells, small diffusion gradients, and they, they end up getting a... Um, a flux to the cell surface that's higher than the large cells. It's the same idea of what makes, gives them the advantage in low nutrient environments. One last question. No? Um, All right, great. Oh.